Good evening. It's great to see you all here. It's always an encouragement to, to meet together and a blessing to be able to meet together with our brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, worship God together. I'd like to share some thoughts from our chapter a day reading uh, with you all today. So if you would, please turn to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. While you're turning there, I'd like to encourage you, if you haven't been keeping up with these chapter a day readings, that um, you'll take care of today no matter what, because I'm about to read it. And um, if you'll just pick up tomorrow with Zechariah 13, uh, it'll, be, it'll be good. It'll be a blessing for you, and, and it'll uh, be a good routine to get into. Zechariah 12. The oracle of the Lord, excuse me, the oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord, who stretched out the heavens and formed the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness. But for the sake of the house of Judah, I will keep my eyes open when I strike every, every horse of the peoples with blindness. Then the clans of Judah shall say to themselves, The inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through the Lord of hosts, their God. On that day I will make the clans of Judah like a blazing pot in the midst of wood, like a flaming torch among sheaves. And they shall devour to the right and to the left all the surrounding peoples, while Jerus Jerusalem shall again be inhabited in its place in Jerusalem. And the Lord will give salvation to the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem may not surpass that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him, as one who mourns for an only child and weeps bitterly over him, as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the morning in Jerusalem will be as great as the morning for Hadath Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the Shemites by itself, and their wives by themselves, and all the families that are left, each by itself, and their wives by themselves. So this is a, an interesting chapter. It has some very uh, kind of different, interesting imagery. Uh, but I'm glad that this was the chapter today, uh, because there's a lot of, of salvation and deliverance that we get from this chapter, and, and that's what I, what I think this is talking about. So I want to just go through several points that we get from chapter 12 here uh, that we can use to, to, to look at our salvation. So the, the first point I want to point out is that uh, salvation is assured by God, God's sovereignty. Uh, God, speaking about himself in the beginning of this chapter, says he identifies himself as one who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Because God created every one of us, he created our souls, our minds, our hearts, our bodies, and in addition to everything in this universe, we can have confidence in our salvation. He is in control. And that's, a, that's maybe a simple thought. Um, you know, we, we would all just certainly believe that. Uh, but it's such a beautiful and comforting thought to God's people that the God that created the whole world guarantees our salvation if we follow his steps of salvation. Second quick point that we get from this is that God can prepare us for trials or prepare us for salvation through trials of this world. Our, when you first read through this chapter, um, it's, it sounds like things are, are going pretty good for Israel. It sounds like God's going to deliver them. Uh, he's going to protect them from their enemies. And things aren't really that bad. Uh, but in verse 2, it talks about how Jerusalem is under siege. When you think of a siege, it's, it's like you're, you know, you're surrounded by your enemies. There are evildoers all around. Um, and you, maybe you're kind of by yourself. 
I think uh, Christians can certainly uh, relate to this. It seems like more than ever, uh, we are just exposed to evil and darkness and sin. Sin seems to be more accepted nowadays than it ever has been. Maybe I'm just getting older and noticing these things, or um, you know, we're just exposed to sin through social media and and our just the culture of our nation just seems like Christianity is is becoming more and more of a, a minority thing. So I think we can relate to this idea of being under siege, uh, like it talks about in verse two. Um, and we also, we go through other trials as, as the rest of the world does. We, we suffer loss of friends and family. We all go through health issues. Um, we certainly, you know, life is not easy on this world. When people encounter trials, there, there are several uh, things that can happen. Sometimes people begin to doubt God's goodness, or they'll begin to doubt that God is really in control. Um, or we can, we can use our trials and the things that we go through um, in order to better ourselves. So Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5 says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So the, the trials that we go through, the suffering that we experience in this world, they can make us bitter, they can make us angry at God, or to, to want to turn our backs on Him, um, or we can use them to make ourselves better. We can, they can produce in us endurance, character, and hope. And all of those characteristics, all those qualities, are things that Christians need in order to run the good race that we're called to run, um, and to live the, the life that Christians are called to live. The next point that we can get from this chapter is that salvation is completely God's work. It's all from God. Our text here makes it very clear that it, that it is God that is performing all these things on, on Israel's behalf. I counted at least ten times in chapter 12 that God speaks of some action that He is either taking then or that He's going to take in the future. And I think it, it's kind of summarized in verse 7 where it says, And the Lord will give salvation. This principle is uh, confirmed in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 2. I'll read verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Sal salvation uh, and deliverance, they, they can't come from being a good person, they don't, they don't come from uh, you know, doing good works. It's nothing that, that we have done that, that caused us to have salvation. It is only made available to us through God's loving, tender care, and through the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> Fourth point uh, about salvation that we get is that salvation requires looking to Jesus in faith. If you'll look back at verse 10, um, there's just a remarkable prophecy of Jesus on the cross. I'll go ahead and read that again. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child. So God is speaking about himself and says that they look on me, on him whom they have pierced. Well, God does it in human flesh. He, you know, he can't be pierced with a sword or a spear. Uh, but Jesus, who is God in human flesh, was pierced on our behalf upon the cross. And then if you'll also notice, um, God speaks about himself in the first person when they look on me. And then he switches to the third person. Um, and, and, and switches to, to, calling, to saying him upon him whom they pierced. To me, that's a, that's a clear reference uh, to Jesus, um, God in the flesh. So our salvation requires us stepping out in faith and being baptized into Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, it's not enough to just say, you know, I believe in God, so there's my salvation, or to say a prayer and, and that that, is, that saves you. It requires being baptized into Jesus. <clears throat> the final point we get here is that um, salvation is accompanied by a mournful, repentant heart. So verses 10 through 14, um, gives, it gives that prophecy of Jesus, and then it talks about um, mourning and, and the sadness that the people, um, when they realize that they missed Jesus and that they crucified him, um, there's just this, this mourning that the people feel as a parent who mourns for the death of a child. 
to me, this just shows that you know, while while salvation isn't anything that we do, it's it's something that only is available through God. Uh, you know, it was a heavy price that that made it available. It was the death of God's own Son, and it is our sin, each of our individual sins, that put Him on the cross. That truth should should cause us to grieve and to mourn our sin, and and cause us to want to genuinely repent and turn from our our old ways, so that we can be in fellowship with God. Zechariah 12 is, is a comfort to God's people. We should, we should read this and feel comforted, and Christians for, forevermore should. Um, it shows God's mighty power to save us, which is an immense blessing. There's no greater blessing than, than, the, saving, than the salvation that we have through God. But if you've yet to repent of your sins and be baptized into Christ, you don't have the comfort of knowing that, that you're right with God, that you can meet in fellowship with Him. So I'd like to open up the invitation. If, if anyone needs to be baptized tonight or needs the prayers of the church for any reason, why don't you come forward, please, as we stand now.